John 6, 37 to 40. John chapter 6, verse 7, uh, 37 to 40. Who can read that? Oh, actually, Andrew, read it, because you were, you were going to read a minute ago, and then Jeremiah. John 6, 37 to 40. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. All right, very good. So let's just, you got the text open before you. Let's, let's work through real quick some of these statements. Notice the promise, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will, in no, I will in no wise, I will never cast out. The Father gives a people to the Son. And in time, they come to the Son and are received by the Son. The Son keeps them safe in Him. What's the purpose? Verse 38. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So here's the purpose of the incarnation, to do the will of the Father. What is that will? Verse 39 tells us, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. The Father's will is for Christ to draw and keep those given to him. He draws them, they come to him in faith, he receives them, and he keeps them, resulting in their resurrection to life on the last day. This is the purpose for which Christ came to earth. It spans from eternity to eternity. Notice the references to eternity past, all that the Father hath given me, and to eternity future. I will raise them up on the last day. What does that indicate? that God has one redemptive purpose for humanity. The coming of Christ in the fullness of time embraces what was done in eternity past and what will take place at the end of human history. That's one redemptive purpose. And the covenant of grace is a great way to describe that. So, covenant of works, covenant of grace. Conclusions. The covenant of works and grace shape, re shape redemptive history in two ways. Number one, God deals with all humans in terms of two people, Adam and Christ. God deals with all humans in terms of two people, Adam and Christ. I love this saying. I think it's either from Bill Jones or Dr. Cairns. I can't remember. You, you could really say that God in history has only known two men, right? Adam and Christ. There's the, the, the first Adam. And is it second Adam or is it second man? I always get it mixed up in Romans. But you have the first man, the last man. The first Adam. Are they both? Okay, good. Then I don't feel so bad about mixing them up. God deals with all humans in terms of two people, Adam and Christ. Two, everything that comes between Genesis 1 through 3 and Revelation 21 through 22 is about God's purpose to restore man to his fallen state. What is lost in Genesis 3 is regained in Revelation 21 through 22. Revelation 21 being, now I saw a new heaven, a new earth coming down, and you know Jerusalem prepared like a bride. There's the end, there's the eternal state. Everything from the beginning, everything in the end, is all about God restoring man to his fallen state. John Milton wrote, Paradise Lost and Paradise Restored. That's what the Bible is all about. Questions? You say that the purpose is to restore man, but there is more that we gain more than what Adam had. Yes. Yes, good point. Thank you. We, we are restored and given eternal life, the life perhaps that Adam would have enjoyed had he kept the covenant. And also, because of God's wisdom, we appreciate things even greater because we're redeemed. So, right. But that there's the fixing, obviously, of what was lost with what will come. So hence the new, you know, the, the man's ultimate destination is not just heaven, but new heavens and new earth. So, all right. 
Abrahamic, Mosaic, and New Covenants. Introduction. The shape of redemptive history refers most specifically to the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants and alludes to a third. Let me read you a passage from Galatians 3. Now, we're going to do Galatians 3. We're going to focus on it, but let's just read it real quick as an overview. Notice the reference to the covenants. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not in the seeds as of many, but as of one, into thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God and Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of law, it is no more of promise, but, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by the angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now we'll talk about how all these interact with each other. But notice the three points that Paul plotted in his map of redemptive history right there. You've got the promise given to Abraham, the law, which was 430 years later, and then these references to what has now come to fulfillment in Christ. There's the Abrahamic covenant, there's the Mosaic covenant, and there is the New Covenant. Verses 15 through 16, touching on Abrahamic, verse 17 on Mosaic, verses 19 and 23, 22 through 25, touching on the New. And the reason I'm, I'm relating Christ in the New Covenant, even though it's not mentioned right there in Galatians, it's because of Hebrews 12.24, Jesus the mediator of the New Covenant. So when we talk about the ministry of Christ, we are talking about the administration of the New Covenant. And, and we're actually going to take time to wor work through all that. But just for now, notice that Paul highlights those three covenants in his discussion of redemptive history, grace, faith, works, law, sin, and death. They all circle around these three covenants. They occupy a central place in the administration of God's redemptive purpose, and they warrant special consideration from the perspective of their Old Testament context before addressing how the biblical authors compare and contrast them in the New. Let's go ahead and start Abrahamic. We might even get through Abrahamic before we break for lunch. Let's at least try to make way in the Abrahamic covenant. Now, as we move into this part of the lectures, um, we're still, of course, going to refer directly to the text, but understand we are dealing with huge sweeps of biblical narrative here, okay? So we, we don't have time to read Genesis 12 through 22 and, and highlight every, every detail there. We're not going to read Exodus through Deuteronomy this afternoon, okay? I want you guys to, you know, stick with me. And so we're going to refer to some large sweeps here and, and try to hit the high points. There are four key points in the Abraham narratives. Number one, you have the giving of the promise, which is the call of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And a lot of the information I'm giving here is just to help structure your mind on the story just in case you're not familiar with the content of these books. Now, if you've mastered Old Testament chapter content, great. But if you haven't, what I'm giving you is, is, is the highlights so that you've got a general idea in your mind of how the story works. So you've got the giving of the promise, the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. You've got the making of the covenant. Is number two. The making of the covenant where you have the promise of descendants and land. This is Genesis 13, verses 14 to 16, and chapter 15, verses 1 to 21. You have the confirming of the covenant, the sign of circumcision, Chapter 17, verses 1 to 16. This is where God confirms 
the covenant. And then you have Abraham's obedience and confirmation of the promises by oath. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. And there's where he is called to sacrifice Isaac. We actually are going to read through actually some of these. And as we do, I want you to look at three focal points. Number one, look for those references to the covenant. Number two, look for what God promises to do. And number three, look at what Abraham must do. All right? So you've got the four key points, and we're going to look at them really quickly under three focal points. The reference to the covenant, what God promises to do, and what Abraham must do. So first key point, the giving of the promise, the call of Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Who wants to read it for me? Genesis 12. Yep, Andrew, ready? Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Alright, very good. So, y'all, y'all get excuse me, you, interact with me and give me some feedback here. Verse 1, what must Abraham do? Leave his country. Go to the land God will show him. Verses 2 to 3, what does God promise to do? Absolutely. Anything else? Make his name great. Bless him. Curse the nations who do not uh, bless him. Alright, so there's the giving of, of the... Uh, promise the call to Abraham you don't actually have on the surface any references to the covenant so skip ahead then point two to Genesis 13 verses 14 through 16 and chapter 15 so let me read me Genesis 13 verses 14 through 16 and the Lord said unto Ab- Abram after that lot was separated from him Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Very good. What does God promise to do? Two things. What are they? They're in those verses. Okay. Give Abraham the land, and what else? Give Abraham what? seed innumerable descendants not really anything in there that abraham must do i mean other than look around i don't that's not like a covenant keeping obligation so uh skip ahead then to chapter 15 this is huge um it's a little long but this is this is going to be good somebody go ahead and read verses 1 to 21 of, of genesis 15 who would do that owen genesis 15 i want you to read the first 21 verses you do that after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my, my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against the another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. 
and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cabanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. All right, very good. All right, let's let's look at what's going on here in Genesis 15. First of all, you've got finally our first reference to the covenant in verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Literally in Hebrew, he cut a covenant. Karath bereth. He cut a covenant with Abraham. Now, what is it in this text that God promises to do? And it's mainly in verses 18 through 21. Give him the land. We have a promise here that God will give Abraham the land. Now, obviously, at some point, we're going to connect all these to the larger picture of Christ, etc. But just, just for now, right on the text, we see that. What is it that Abraham must do? What must Abraham do to enjoy the blessings of the covenant God? No one? Well, obviously faith. Faith. And anything else in this text? Offering. Offering. Um, particular verse you're looking at? I mean, the, the sacrifice. Okay, so he's got to bring the sacrifice for, this, for the ceremony. Um, anything other like big picture that Abraham must do to keep the covenant? No, that's the whole point. There's nothing else he has to do. Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him. He reckoned it to him as righteousness. That is the significance of of the ceremony and the fact that Abraham slept through it in verses 13 through 17. Here's what God is doing. God is entering into a covenant initiation ceremony. They're to take these animals and they're to cut them in half. And normally, both people would walk through as contemporaries saying, if I break the covenant, this is what will happen to me. I'll be cut in half. I'll be killed. I'll die. I'll bring the curse of the covenant upon myself. God is coming to Abraham. He calls him out of the land of Chaldee. He promises him these descendants. He promises him this land. He makes. He promises to be his God and his shield and his reward. And when it comes time for them to walk through the, the, the path and commit themselves to the covenant, God puts Abraham to sleep. And God himself walks through the animals, and says, I and I alone will keep the terms of this covenant. All you must do is believe me. Uh, you, you, you cannot overstate the significance of only God passing between the pieces. What's the meaning of the land here? The land here, at, right on the surface of it, is the land of Canaan. And I think, yeah, typologically you have the idea of land representing rest where God is and as the Bible moves across redemptive history uh, I'm happy with seeing the focus changing to the idea of where God is and where God gives his people rest is the land so that I'm not demanding a literal fulfillment of the land of Canaan and say some future millennial state plus you have references to Joshua and Solomon taking this land so this promise has been fulfilled but yeah right here on the surface it's the land of Canaan and a little free eschatology thrown in for Vic. So. Uh, is that satisfied with that answer? Yes. Exile. Well, I think it was under Joshua and Solomon. I don't have the reference in front of me, but 
in the conquest and in the Solomonic expansion, they got the land of Canaan. Just, temp- just temporarily. But so that if the land focus were to shift into the New Testament, we could not accuse God of not keeping his word because he did give them the land. And plus the land is a pointer to something greater. Beth. And I, I'll take heat and push back as I mean I can't defend it. I can't defend this like super well. I'm just this is stuff I'm still thinking through. Please, I like it. Uh, I'm not sure how to state this, but in the scripture reading recently I came across the use of the word forever. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Which is frequently used in scripture. Mm-hmm. And you will dwell here forever. Mm-hmm. And we'll put my name here in the temple forever. That was the reference. Gotcha. I will place my name here. I think it was in the reading of the establishment of the temple and song. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I will put my name here forever. Yep. Yep. You say, but what happened? The right. The was destroyed. So how is that promise fulfilled? Mm-hmm. But then you read on in the passage and it says, if mm-hmm. you keep mm-hmm. my laws, but if you don't, that yep. house will be destroyed. Yep. So I'm thinking of that in terms of this discussion and how that plays into, you know, the covenant. Yeah, yeah. I Here with Israel to possess the land, there was that stipulation and repeated throughout the Old Testament, but if you do not keep the covenant, then you will be exiled. That was history. Yep, absolutely. I, I, think, I think that's kind of the answer to the question. Is God, number one, the land was conditional upon their obedience. Um, these are antecedent elements to the Abrahamic covenant that they received while they were obeying and lost when they were disobedient, which, of course, that has political implications, does it not, for, you know, when we talk about national Israel having a right to the land. I mean, they have a right. I'm not, I'm not some PLO guy, don't get me wrong, but, you know, they have a right to the land as they obey their God. It's, it's something he gives, gives, gives to them. Uh, so he did give it to them, but then in their disobedience, they lost it. And it's not that, therefore, the blessing of God is permanently lost, but that's where I then think, as you see us shifting into the New Testament, a different way of highlighting what it means to have land and temple. And it taking a more general sense of where I am, where you have rest, you're in the land. I think the fact that you cite the temple is a great point. Because temple is one of those ones where in the New Testament, you have God saying, what? You are my temple. You know, the do you not know that your body is the temple of the Lord? That's not actually an individual reference that has application there. That's actually a reference to the church. The church is my temple. And that's where I dwell. And I'll always dwell with my people. I'll dwell with them forever. But it will look different in coming into the New Testament. Yes, ma'am. Can we see playing into this our understanding of national Israel versus spiritual Israel as Paul discusses it in Romans? Absolutely. And the reality of the promise of a new heavens and a new earth, which will never be destroyed. Right. And wherein dwells righteousness. Yep. There, the promise is fulfilled without any any loss of the promise, because then the covenant will be, the covenant conditions will be yep. completely fulfilled. Yep. Uh, that's, that's a great point. Yep, I'm, I'm glad you brought in that new heaven, new earth, because... You know, it's, it's not that God is waiting for this thousand-year period where he can make good on his promises. It's, it's moving in a trajectory of, without losing what was originally there, being expanded and, 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 and encompassing more and more the further redemptive history goes. So, yeah, then when we come to the culmination of time, the meek inherit the earth and fulfill the promises of the Abraham covenant. It's good eschatology. <laughs> Um, in this chapter, um, there are some specific locations that are mentioned by God. Right. Um, so that is fulfilled in Solomon age, but um, is that conditional or unconditional promise? If it is conditional, I can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not unconditional, actually, it is condition. Unconditional. I'm sorry. You're good. If it is unconditional, um, the I think the God promise 
I think what you're hitting on is a good tension between are these covenants conditional covenants or are they unconditional covenants? I think you've, you've just got elements of both. But I think I interrupted you. Finish. I'm sorry. Yeah, but this passage you emphasize the faith. Mm -hmm. So it should be unconditional. Mm -hmm. So God will fulfill all the promises. Yep, yep. Yep, I, and I think he will. I think I think what you've got here is, first of all, faith itself is, is obviously the condition. It's not a work, but one must believe like Abraham in order to receive these blessings. And that's what you've got with Israel is the God never stops offering the covenant to Israel and to his people. But it is of each generation and each individual to own the covenant. It is unconditional. It is forever in the sense that God never says, that's it, I'm done. I'm going on and doing some other thing. He comes back time and time again with the covenant and offers it anew. But it must be embraced and owned by faith, by each person, by each generation, etc. So I think that's maybe how conditional and unconditional work together there. The second thing is, what is it that God is specifically promising? He is promising land here. Totally down with that. The land of Canaan. It is given to them by means of promise. But I, I, I'm comfortable with a little renegotiation changed meaning as we get more and more revelation. Temple gives way to church. And I think land gives way to God dwelling with his people and giving them earth. And um, ceremony gives way to Christ. So it's not that one is forgotten but they do seem to be typological and therefore brought to fulfillment in something greater. And once the greater comes, then, then the type can fall away. So you mean the promise about land will be fulfilled in some... Typological fashion, yeah. Mm -hmm. Andrew? This is an interesting question for someone who does hold literal fulfillment mm -hmm. of land. Mm -hmm. When the millennium ends, you have the same dilemma that an all millennialist has to face right now. Hmm. Well, the millennium's over. Does that mean God's promise is done? Hmm. It, I mean, now, maybe they have an answer to that. Right, That's right. The question that I would have is... Oh, right, right, so right. So does that mean God's promise right. is unconditional? Does forever mean, in that the sense we think of it as eternal, or I mean, it does mean at times for a long time? In the sense of, you know, this endures. This this isn't limited to human. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, it obviously has to give way to new heavens and new earth at some point. Can we in interpret the term forever as it's used in Scripture and various of these passages in the sense that then is referring to as being unconditional? In other words, never is his promise not good mm -hmm. except when the conditions are not Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yep. What was I going to say? I was going to say something similar to that. But just that God is continually, yeah, offering it. So, All right, others? All right, well, we'll break there. Let you guys get some food, guys and gals, get some food. And when we pick up, we'll just we'll keep working through these texts, just getting the, the big idea, and then we'll, we'll study, all right, what contribution does this make to redemptive history?